So I'm delighted today to give you this presentation on systemic mastocytosis. My name is Tracy George. I'm a professor of pathology at the University of Utah and ARUP Laboratories. These are my disclosures. And this is the outline for the lecture today. So let's go ahead and get started with mastocytosis basics. Mastocytosis is a clonal mast cell neoplasm driven by a mutation D816V in KIT. This results in hyperactivation and proliferation of neoplastic mast cells that can lead to debilitating mediator symptoms in skin, GI, and neurological domains. And these patients have a significant symptom-directed polypharmacy. This is the estimated prevalence of systemic mastocytosis in the United States. But only about 5% of patients with systemic mastocytosis have what's called advanced disease, where these patients have organ damage and decreased survival. More than 95% of patients have non-advanced systemic mastocytosis, but they still suffer long-term with significant morbidity and poor quality of life. And there's been no effective approved therapies to reduce the burden of disease in these non-advanced patients. So when I talk about mast cell disorders, I'll be focusing on clonal disorders, and I will not focus on non-clonal disorders or secondary mast cell activation syndrome or idiopathic MCAS. So what is mastocytosis? Well, it's a very heterogeneous disorder because it presents as skin lesions that spontaneously regress in children as shown in these images to highly aggressive leukemias with short survival and multi-organ failure. And the subtypes of mastocytosis that are determined by the distribution of disease and the clinical manifestations of disease. And we now know that advanced systemic mastocytosis is a multi-mutated myeloid neoplasm, like AML. And this is some work that came out of Andreas Reiter's laboratory a few years ago. And so this is another way to think about it. You have those patients who have the KIT D816V mutation only in the mast cell lineage as shown at top. And most of those patients have indolent systemic mastocytosis with fewer having smoldering or chronic mast cell leukemia. Then there's patients who have multi-lineage involvement. So you have the KIT D816V mutation in both mast cells and other hematopoietic lineages. And these are typically patients with systemic mastocytosis and an associated hematologic neoplasm, usually myeloid disorders. So if you check these patients' peripheral blood using a super sensitive quantitative PCR technique for KIT D816V, it'll be positive um, even though there's no circulating mast cells. And then third uh, group of patients are those who have multi-lineage involvement plus multi-mutated disease. So they have these additional somatic mutations as shown below. So let's go through some diagnostic algorithms. So this is a patient we saw many years ago and the dermatologists were very excited because he has Tmap and a rare form of cutaneous mastocytosis in adults. And when we, they told me about this patient, I said, we need to do a bone marrow biopsy because most adults with cutaneous mastocytosis lesions actually have systemic disease. And those that don't, it's usually a sampling error. So the NCCN guidelines now are that these patients should have a skin biopsy to confirm cutaneous involvement by mastocytosis, serum tryptase level, quantitative PCR for KIT D816V in the peripheral blood, as well as a bone marrow biopsy with appropriate ancillary studies, as I'll talk about shortly. And what about those adults who don't have mastocytosis skin lesions, but have signs and symptoms that are suspicious for mastocytosis? For, so for them, we also start with quantitative PCR in, in the peripheral blood, and if that's positive for a KIT D816V mutation, you'll go straight to a bone marrow biopsy. If that's negative, you'll check the serum tryptase level. 
Those that have normal tryptase levels don't have mastocytosis. Those that have elevated more than 20 likely do. And those in between, you might want to evaluate other symptoms because these patients might have what's called hereditary alpha tryptosemia or increased copy numbers of the gene that encodes for alpha tryptase, or it's known as HAT, nicely published by John Lyons and colleagues. And these patients can or cannot have systemic mastocytosis. So what do you need to do in terms of the mastocytosis pathology testing standard of care, where there's the typical laboratory studies like CBC and serum tryptase and others, and the morphology, you need to look at your blood smear, your bone marrow aspirate smear, your bone marrow biopsy, and as well as assessing for um, fibrosis with reticulin and trichrome stains. You also want to look for other associated hematologic neoplasms like MDS. You might do iron stains for ring sideroblasts. And you need to phenotype the mast cells. That can be done by flow cytometry on a fresh bone marrow aspirate, which is important because you can look at mast cells as well as other lineages. And you can also do that via immunohistochemistry on the bone marrow biopsy with the markers as shown. And importantly, genetics are very key here. You want to do a karyotype. You want to do fish for PGFR alpha if the patient has eosinophilia. Um, and you also want to do, again, the quantitative PCR for kit d 816 v in the uh, bone marrow, as well as a myeloid gene panel um, if you are suspecting that your patient has an advanced form or smoldering form of systemic mastocytosis, and you may need to check for hereditary alpha tryptosemia. So it's quite a workup. So what about classification? Well, the 2017 WHO classification goes through cutaneous, systemic, they added smoldering, um, they clarified that mast cell leukemia could be acute or chronic, and they got rid of this rare category of extracutaneous mastocytoma. And this is the major diagnostic criteria for systemic mastocytosis. You have to have either one major or one minor or at least three minor criteria. And these are typically um, uh, done on a bone marrow biopsy. So you're looking for multifocal dense aggregates of mast cells, a typical morphology, the KIT D816 mutation, and aberrant expression with CD25 expression with or without CD2 and increased serum total tryptase unless you have another associated myeloid disorder, because that can also have an increased serum tryptase. And so this is the way I think about it. There's cutaneous and there's systemic disease. There's those patients who have more indolent disease, that's indolent SM and smoldering, and those patients who have more advanced disease. You can further classify your more indolent using B findings or burden of disease findings. So those patients who have less than two B findings um, have indolent and those with two or more have smoldering where B findings include mast cell infiltration burden and the bone marrow more than 30% and serum tryptase greater than 200, organomegaly without impaired organ function and signs of dysplasia or uh, myeloproliferation in a bone marrow, but you don't meet the criteria for an MDS or an NPN. And then there's the advanced. There's three forms. There's mast cell leukemia, 20% or more mast cells on the aspirate smear or blood smear. That's it. There's SMAHN. You have to meet both criteria for systemic mastocytosis as well as for a WHO um, associated hematologic neoplasm. And again, these are myeloid, MDS, AML, CMMML, MDS, MPNU. If you have a lymphoid, it's more often thought that you just have two uh, neoplasms just by happenstance. And then there's aggressive systemic mastocytosis, and that's defined by having one or more C or cytoreductive uh, requiring findings like cytopenias, hepatomegaly with impaired liver function, um, osteolytic lesions or pathologic fractures, splenomegaly with hypersplenism, and malabsorption due to GI mast cell infiltrates. So now I'm gonna spend the bulk of the time talking about therapy. And this is a, a, a nice overall survival, Kaplan-Meier curves from um, the Mayo group. And it really shows you how those patients with indolent disease as shown in uh, bright orange here, behave the same 
as age match controls in terms of overall survival, whereas those patients with mast cell leukemia in green or SMH and MD in gray or um, ASM uh, in yellow uh, have a much worse overall survival. And this is how it was up until a few years ago. But we now know that kit mutations in mast cell disease have important implications for which tyrosine kinase inhibitors that you're going to use, because most of these patients with systemic mastocytosis are imatinib resistant, with only rare patients having juxtamembrane mutations as shown here, which are imatinib sensitive. And so classically, there there's been four big broad categories of treatment, observationally, perhaps for those patients with you know, minimal cutaneous disease, topical therapy, symptomatic therapy for those patients um, with systemic disease and many symptoms, and cytoreductive therapy has typically been reserved only for those patients with advanced systemic mastocytosis. So back in 2016, we uh, published uh, a multi-center international study on the efficacy and safety of midostorin um, in advanced systemic mastocytosis. It took many years to get enough patients for this. <laughs> and we showed that you had an overall response rate of 60% for any subtype of advanced systemic mastocytosis, ranging from 75% in ASM to 50% in patients with mast cell leukemia. This looked at a large number of patients, 89, uh, with disease. These patients had a variety of major responses and partial responses, um, no CRs in this particular study. And importantly, um, the duration of response um, was quite good with a medium of 24 months for any subtype. And indeed, it wasn't even reached for patients with ASM or mast cell leukemia because these patients were still living with disease. Uh, we had clinical pathological measures of response, including bone marrow mast cell burden and serum tryptase. And you can see these waterfall plots, which show um, a marked change from baseline in these patients with decreases in bone marrow mast cell burden and serum tryptase. Uh, after this uh, study, we published the investigator-initiated trial, um, which had actually been started before the previous study. So these patients had long, uh, many years of follow-up as shown here. This looked at 26 patients who had an overall response rate of 69% at one year. And you can see in this study, we did have a few complete remissions as shown in bright green. And we also showed that midostorin improves the quality of life and mediator-related symptoms in patients with advanced SM, um, as shown in this nice uh, study published by Karen Hartman in uh, Jackie. But where are we today? Well, so here are a bunch of small molecules that target KIT, and you can see midostorin here. Um, where bright yellow is uh, binding to KIT. And then there's also many off-target um, here, kinases. And this is why midostorin is called the dirty TKI, right? But if you go over here on the left, I'm gonna talk about avapritinib, which is known as a selective KIT inhibitor. So this is data from the EXPLORE study. In part one was the dose escalation with 32 patients, and part two was the dose expansion at 48 patients. This is, was specifically targeted for patients, adult patients with advanced uh, systemic mastocytosis. Here are the baseline characteristics. We had a total of 80 patients, but only 48 were evaluable using modified international working group criteria. And it's interesting, if you look at this group of patients, the um, MIWG evaluable patients um, had, uh, were sicker, they had a higher bone marrow mass cell burden, they had higher levels of serum uh, tryptase as well. Um, also importantly, when you look at all the patients in the study, you can see here that there's patients with advanced SM and then there's patients who don't have advanced SM. And that's because after a uh, central review by the uh, study steering committee, we found that not all of these patients actually had advanced SM. And here's cha changes in measures of mast cell burden. Again, waterfall plots looking at bone marrow mast cells and serum tryptase, where you can see a marked reduction in uh, bone marrow mast cell and serum tryptase in these patients. 
There were also decreases in spleen volume as shown at left and uh, decreases in the kit D816B mutant allele fraction. And this was using, again, a very sensitive quantitative PCR method, uh, in this case in the bone marrow. So what we saw was a high rate of uh, modified IWG response, regardless of the subtype of disease, as well as after metastorin therapy. And so you can see the overall response rate here is shown as 77%. Here it is by a subtype of advanced SM. And also uh, you saw a 60% overall response rate after metastorin uh, therapy. And the overall survival in these patients was not reached for any subtype at two years. So I want to focus a little bit on adverse events. Most AEs were grade one and grade two, although 15% of patients discontinued treatment due to clinical progression and six patients due to treatment-related AEs. However, we did have four of nine patients with uh, low platelet counts less than 50,000 um, who had an intracranial bleeding event. And 3% or 2 of 71 patients with platelets 50,000 or more at baseline had a non-traumatic intracranial bleeding event and treatment-related grade 3 thrombocytopenia. And now I want to look at avapritinib in the Pioneer study, and this is in patients with indolent disease. Uh, part one was the dose selection study, where ultimately 25 milligrams per day was selected. And part two was the pivotal study. This was the double-blind placebo-controlled uh, randomized clinical trial. And what we found is that avapritinib reduces signs and symptoms in indolent SM. This is using the uh, indolent SM symptom assessment form. At left are patients who receive placebo, where uh, the, the solid line is baseline and the dotted uh, red line is at week 24. And at right are patients who received avapritinib. And you can see there is a marked decrease in the total symptom score, as well as all of the individual symptoms in these patients. We also looked at photography in those patients who had mastocytosis lesions. So at top are baseline and our bottom are our patients on study. And this is from a variety of patients. And high resolution skin photographs were taken. Uh, there was a blinded skin assessment um, committee. And then we also, I'm not going to show you this, but there was detailed image analysis on this as well. And this data shows that avapritinib lightens the color of skin lesions at right is all of the patients with on avapritinib who had skin lesions of mastocytosis versus placebo shown at left. And we also looked at skin biopsies from these patients from both their le skin lesions as well as non-lesional skin. You can see this uh, at top where the brown stain is the kit or CD117 stain. And here it is after 12 weeks. And you can see there was a marked reduction in the number of mast cells in these skin biopsies in patients on avapritinib versus those patients on left who uh, received only placebo. And avapritinib was well tolerated across all doses with no grade 3 AEs at 25 milligrams in this particular study. And I just want to show you what do you see actually in the bone marrow of these patients. So this is a patient with smoldering systemic mastocytosis. They had about 75% involvement by these mast cell lesions. Here's the higher power. You can see the mast cells next to the bone. And here it is after six months of avapritinib, the serum tryptase level is now normal. At left on this H&E, we have a normal cellular bone marrow. We still have some disease. This is an area with the highest concentration of mast cells as shown by CD117 with about 5%. The bone marrow mast cells no longer express CD25. And also there's a de marked decrease in reticulin fibrosis here. So this slide shows the bone marrow response to avapritinib, where at baseline, you have dense multifocal aggregates of mast cells that co-express CD25. But by months three to seven, the bone marrow now becomes hypocellular with only loose aggregates. 
Um, and then by month seven to 11, you have a normal cellular bone marrow with normal numbers of mast cells as shown here in brown, maybe an occasionally typical shape, but the mast cells now have a normal phenotype. They lack CD25 and you have a normal serum tryptase level. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the patients and the investigators uh, for making this talk possible. And thank you for listening to me today.